as I have argued numerous times before on American healthcare and its costs, of course you're going to come across these arguments and you're always going to come across the arguments when speaking about the NHS, someone always turns around and says, go look at American healthcare costs. I just recently had this argument, I've seen it so many times, a boy comes out and says, go look at the American healthcare system if you want to see a train wreck. Theirs is a totally private and diabetics have to pay thousands to literally live. Do you actually think that's morally right? <laughs> First and foremost, I don't think that's morally right that these type of people have to pay thousands. But to say that it's a completely private model alone in of itself is a lie. It isn't private. It's strongly controlled and regulated by government. Costs are high because uh, the, to the extent that the federal government is involved and that third parties uh, basically collude with the federal government and the corporate machine, the free market is not involved. And as much as the, as the statists would like to maintain that the current state of healthcare and the economics of healthcare in the United States is a failure of the free market, it's actually an absence of the free market. Is it the fault of the private sector? Is it the fault of the presence of private ownership this to do with the costs? And the answer to that is no. People like that just want to throw around rhetoric and say, well, it's a for-profit system, therefore that's the reason for expensive costs. No, it's not. Profits are basically consumers' needs and wants, right? If you oppose profits and if you oppose losses, which losses are just as important, you're basically opposing the people. When you speak about American healthcare, there are three main reasons I like to point out for why the healthcare costs go out of control. The American Medical Association is basically a cartel formed by government. Government, and that American Medical Association was granted a monopoly by the United States government. So in other words, in the year 1904, in order to basically drive up physicians' wages, they would restrict the quantity of doctors available in the market. They came to an agreement, an approved agreement by government itself, that they would close down medical schools. Starting from 1904, right up to 1910, for the first six years, they would close down a total of 35 medical schools. Now within the first three years, there was 25 closed down and there was a 50% reduction of medical students, so potential medical doctors. That's quite a massive reduction. Another thing to note in relation to that, over a century long period, the US population vastly increased by 284% and at the same time, there was a 26% reduction in the medical schools. If you don't understand the laws of supply and demand, if you end up creating such a shortage problem, then of course the costs are going to soar out of control. That's how they would engineer such a monopoly so that they could drive up physicians' wages, by restricting the quantity that are there. Because after all, if you increase the population by 284%, there's going to be far more people chasing medical care, isn't there? Of course, there's going to be a higher demand for physicians, but there's fewer of the physicians available in the market. So that meant that with a reduction of 26% of the medical schools, there was only about 123 of the medical schools left. Now I recently came across a very, very sad story and I'll read this out to you. As it says, in April 2016, Charles Johnson and his wife Kira went to the Cheddar's Sinai Hospital in Los Angeles for the birth to their son Langston. They expected it to be one of the happiest days of their life, but soon Charles found they had walked into a nightmare. Within an hour of delivery, Charles noticed blood flowing from Kira's catheter. He called for help but it took over eight hours before a doctor said he could take her back in for surgery to look at her c-section. That was the last time he saw his wife Kira alive. When they opened her up, she died with 3.5 litres of blood in her abdomen. The shortage of the physicians was created by the American Medical Association monopoly, all because of a government-granted monopoly. In other words, it was engineered. Now, to add to that very problem, you then have the issue of the availability 
in placements for students. Take for example in 1996, there was 47,000 applicants applying for medical school but only 16,500 got in, again a government granted monopoly. You see it's all to do with a supply and demand argument, that's in relation to prices. It's not because, oh look here's a private sector and that's it, well oh, look there's private ownership that's it, oh look it's for profits that's it. <laughs> it's got nothing to do with it. As Kel Kelly mentions, high rejection rates are why so many aspiring doctors attend medical schools in the Caribbean, where they are prepared to be American doctors. The medical monopoly also marginalises or outlaws alternative or slightly alternative, i.e. competing medical practices, along with nurses and midwives, who could perform many of the tasks doctors do today. Again, really to a shortage problem, you could really cut out the waste etc just simply by moving towards a free market but they've basically created a monopoly so there's that shortage. The AMA also has monopoly power over the state boards which issue licenses. A physician can practice only by having a state license. Licenses in general exist primarily to prevent competition. Each state has licensing boards consisting of AMA members who decide which applicants, according to them, are competent and morally fit. The boards also have police and enforcement powers to monitor their own kind and keep as many nasty incidents as possible out of the public eye. One of the saddest things here is the very fact that Milton Friedman had explained all of this. He warned you of what the American Medical Association had done. Have a listen to what Milton Friedman says here. And in my opinion, the right cure would be all the way. No government regulation, no government subsidization, and to take the point which will shock most of you, and yet which is equally important, no licensure of physicians. That point is included because of the necessity of reducing and eliminating the monopoly power of the American Medical Association. That monopoly power has derived almost entirely from the fact that the, that the practice of medicine is an activity which can be engaged in by only by those who have licenses from government. And the control over that licensure procedure is what has enabled the American Medical Association to exercise its monopoly power for these many decades. Now the American Medical Association, the AMA monopoly, wasn't the only reason for why American healthcare costs got out of control. And again, it's got nothing to do with private ownership. But governments controlling the private sector, strong government regulation, and this is the secondary problem. Because the private sector in American healthcare, in the main healthcare market, is over-regulated by the state. Part of the reason is, um, is that the giant hospitals actually actually like the regulations that put their smaller competitors out of business. Um, uh, Jim Epstein at Reason Magazine has told me that the smoking gun he oftentimes looks for for a good story of crony capitalism sort of corruption is industry consolidation. And these giant and awful regulations that the hospitals oftentimes complain about behind closed doors, they're celebrating because they know that while they're onerous to some degree for the giant hospitals, they're completely debilitating for their smaller competitors. So what you can see is because of the main American healthcare market having all this red tape, what it's done is it's created this oligopoly in the American healthcare market that's enabled giant hospitals to basically gain is similar, somewhat similar to that of a monopoly. And again, if you've got fewer hospitals in quantity and supply, you've got a greater demand. <laughs> you think about the, the vast increase of 284% of the population, then of course you're going to be faced with the supply and demand problem where supply of what is available in terms of hospitals and of course the medical doctors etc etc, it's in shortage in ratio to that of the demand of the consumer because again if you increase the size of the population more people are going to be chasing medical treatment. The smaller hospitals 
were going out of business because they can't afford the heavier costs of the government regulation. So it's the absence of competition. Therefore, it's got nothing to do with the free market. This is anti-free market. That's why there's a problem. It's not because of competition. It's the absence of competition. It's the destruction of competition. That's why the costs have soared out of control. And what destroyed the competition? <laughs> Government's regulation. <laughs> That's precisely why. If you look at the food and drug administration, the Food and, and Drug Administration, and Milton Friedman has pointed this out himself before. Today, every drug marketed in the United States must pass the FDA. It's clear that this has protected us from some drugs with horrific side effects, like thalidomide. And we all know of people who have benefited from modern drugs. What we don't hear much about, however, are the beneficial drugs that the FDA has prohibited. Well, if you examine uh, the therapeutic significance of drugs that haven't arrived in the US uh, but are available somewhere in the rest of the world, such as in Britain, you can uh, come across numerous examples where the patient has suffered. For example, there are one or two uh, drugs called beta blockers, which uh, it now appears can prevent death after a heart attack. We call this secondary prevention of uh, coronary death after myocardial infarction, uh, which if available here could be saving um, about 10,000 lives a year in the United States. In the 10 years after the 1962 amendments, no drug was approved for hypertension, that's for the control of blood pressure, in the United States, whereas several were approved in Britain. In the entire cardiovascular area, only one drug was approved uh, in the five-year period from 67 to 72. Um, and this can be correlated with known organisational problems at FDA. Here's the main reason, because you're always going to hear, and people always turn to the whole issue on the big pharma, how they shafted the consumer. Well, how do they think that problem was created? The problem was created, again, through government's intervention that engineered what we call, and this is probably the biggest reason is to do with the third party payer system. The old saying is whose bread I eat, his song I sing. And if the if the physician's compensation is derived from a third party other than the patient, then ultimately conflicts will arise. And when they do, it'll be the it'll be the individual or the group paying for the person's care, not the actual patient whose interests will be represented. So it is a very it's a very distorting influence and is the primary reason that healthcare costs are hot. If you don't understand what a third party payer system means, it simply means that someone else other than the consumer gets to determine the costs. The costs are monopolized in the hands of third parties. Now why is this nothing to do with a free market? Because in a free market model of healthcare, the consumer is the one that gets to shop around. The consumer is the one that gets to decide which private provider they go to. And they get to decide, you know, on the costs themselves because they're the ones deciding whether they pay directly or not. So it's a direct payment. That's not how a third party payer system operates. There is no straight transaction between the consumer and the provider. In other words, the costs are monopolised in the hands of third parties. And who created that very problem? The United States government. That's who engineered the third party payer system. Because the consumer cannot have a straight transaction. It means the consumer is eliminated from the equation. It simply means that there is no shopping around for the cheaper cost. Therefore, there's no competition in the market. And as a result of this third party payer system that's been engineered and created by the United States government, that the third parties in the background can get away with shafting the consumer at free will. So what did the third party payer system enable the giant pharmaceutical companies to get away with doing? They got away with colluding together to drive the prices up because of the third party payer system. To some recent comments I got in a recent video, first of all, as Pee Wee goes on to say, are you still in a disagreement with Rocking Mystery? I'm not in a disagreement with the guy. You know, there's certain things that he obviously sees and I can understand his argument on the issue to do with China and, ju and dumping the steel. The issue for my argument would be to cut off trade with those sort of nations and create a union of trade of nations that trade freely and 
fairly in the free market but I do respect his own personal view and to be honest with you I was in a, a very very bad state in my life at that time. I was in a very depressive state. I took things out on people, he was unfortunately one of them, you know I've, I've got nothing but respect for the, the guy personally, you know that's why I kinda had to distance myself. Are things perfect today? You know I'm far better off than where I was three years ago that's for sure, so I don't I don't have any problem with rocking mystery. 123 Berserk goes on to mention, have you watched Mouth the Inf Infidel's take on this in regards to Marxism? Of course this was in relation to my video on the labour theory of value, when it came down to that of Karl Marx. He did not accept from what I gather on the subject of theory and he most certainly therefore did not accept the laws of supply and demand. What this mouthy infidel was basically trying to claim was that oh well you know Karl Marx accepted the laws of supply and demand and prices being able to fluctuate and I'm thinking to myself what? And when you speak about accepting the market where prices fluctuate that's saying you, you accept leaving prices be to the free market so Karl Marx had most certainly did not accept anything like that. So I didn't say it goes on to mention did Henry Ford produce cars only for the rich? It's just like the same thing of technology and televisions etc. You remember the days of televisions costing more than £10,000 etc and it would be expensive and it would be only affordable for the rich. Well over time the more that would be produced the more they can bring the cost down, reduce the price of such goods to make it more affordable over a period of time for the less fortunate, for those who are poorer. You could see that. That's why most people today are driving about in cars. So what that information is telling you is that over a lengthy period of time, cars became more and more affordable. Of course, when cars were first introduced and first innovated, then of course they're going to be expensive because there's less of them to go around. But the more that they would produce and newer models of cars that would come out, the older models of cars would, be, would drop in price. You also have to look at a target market and price can be what people are willing to pay for something. So that's another constraint that Henry Ford would have been faced with. This other comment I got from Matt Z, he goes on to mention, Brazil is looking for ways to, of getting out of the crisis or to at least mitigate its bad consequences. There is one politician who is in favour of printing more money in order to emerge the economy and I have come across some people saying that even though the printing of money leads to inflation and furthermore the devaluation of the currency, they say that if it is printing it is controlled and respects the demand of money in the country that can be considered as an option to save an economy what do you think about it? Well, here's the issue from what I have gathered from what s someone else has mentioned. There's two ways that you can basically reduce the debt problem. Uh, one would be, of course, defaulting. The other is through printing of the, the fiat currency or whatnot. So the devaluation of the currency. So that's one way you could do so. When you devalue the currency, you would require to curb spending. That means to live within your means. However, you've got certain politicians, like for example here in Scotland with Nicola Sturgeon. She's dangerous. She basically wants to, you know, vastly increase the printing, borrowing and spending. She really doesn't live on the same planet. Anyway folk, I've gone on long enough. Hope this video has been educational for yourself. Talk to you later. Cheers.